Hello. I am Michael DiDonato. I am with the SBDC, Small Business Development Center. I'm going to take a few more seconds as more people come in from the waiting room. Appreciate your patience. Hope everyone's having a good day. I am joined by Lauren Simpson, but she will be off camera today. It is her son's three-year-old birthday, and she is taking him to the Aquarium of the Pacific, which is a wonderful destination. My wife was there a couple of days ago. My grandson, who also loves it, is quite busy at the Aquarium of the Pacific. So I hope you're having a good day. I believe everyone has now joined us. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the SBDC, it is a national program. We have, I think, a thousand plus centers across the nation. It is funded by a grant from the Small Business Administration. That's why I see the logo behind me. It is funded by a grant from the state of California called GoBiz. That's the other logo underneath the Long Beach City College you see behind me. And we are supported by colleges and universities throughout the country. I work out of multiple centers in LA County, including Long Beach Center. Our headquarters is at the uh, Long Beach City College as well. We have approximately 200 counselors, advisors, consultants, whatever you want to call them, that have expertise in many different areas. And I suggest that if you have not taken advantage of our services, that you do. Our goal is economic development for small businesses. And we can help with any number of topics that your challenges that you're facing or grow your company. So we have people, I'm on the capital access to capital team, which helps you get funding. I just concluded a meeting with those folks, funding through VCs or through angels or through lending partners. I um, also have a significant knowledge about crowdfunding as do some of my other colleagues. We have people that specialize in marketing and human resources. And some people will have a specialty in particular operations. The point is, we're here to help you grow your business. We have no extra grind. We take no referral fees. We do have numerous referral partners that we can turn to should we not have the expertise to help you. And that includes governmental agencies, local, city, county, state, and federal. As a matter of fact, one of my colleagues, Max Wilderness, who works out of uh, Long Beach City College, was just in D.C. speaking to the assistant director of SBA last week. So the point is, we also have connections to lots of folks in many different capacities to help you grow your business. I specifically, I have connections to the L.A. County Economic Development Corporation, which is a nonprofit to help grow, biz grow businesses. I'm also a resource for CMTC which is the California Manufacturing Technology Corporation, which also helps businesses with their manufacturing activities, and it's a statewide organization. And many of my colleagues have their own connections to various re referral sources and groups. So with that being said, I'm going to go forward with my presentation. Last week, I promised I would cover leases, and I will go ahead and do so. And I'll go ahead and share my screen. Personally, my background is in finance, accounting, and law. I have two advanced degrees, one in finance and one in, and I have a law degree. And I've worked in lots of different businesses as a controller, as a CFO, and I have my own consulting business where I help people raise money. And as a matter of fact, recently I was appointed as a managing director of an investment banking firm. And an investment banking firm does not invest in is not a bank. We help people sell their companies when they're ready for exit. So that's another thing. If you are in the process of looking for an acquisition, a target, or if you're looking to exit your company, we have people that can help you do that process, including myself. So let's go ahead and go forward with the presentation. Should you have a question, please put it in the q and I'm not in the chat room. I'm not monitoring the chat room. I'd appreciate that. And Lauren has the opportunity to unmute you, uh, should it be appropriate and necessary for you to ask a question verbally. So with that, I've already given you my background. My last name is pronounced Di Donato. And yes, I'm a full-blooded 100% Italian. My mother and father came from Italian stock. And my grandparents came over uh, a while ago. So what can be leased? We have equipment that can be leased. 
vehicles that can be leased, rolling stock, green stump trucks, uh, construction equipment that can be leased. We have all sorts of servers and computers and IT equipment, telecommunications equipment that can be leased, real property, uh, buildings, of course, but also, we can also get a land lease. I live in Marina Del Rey. Marina Del Rey is owned by the county and all the properties here have a land lease through the county because the county of Los Angeles owns Marina Del Rey, uh, not a private party. You can lease office furniture and decor, for example. You can lease software applications and cloud storage. And yes, you can lease workers. Uh, there is a recording available for this presentation. And Lauren, if you could put into the chat room how people can get in touch with us, I'd appreciate that uh, because we have Augusta Sutherland who wants to know how he can get in touch with an SBDC advisor. Um, so, as I mentioned, you can lease workers through something called a PEO, Professional Employer Organization. So any asset, basically you can lease almost anything. That's the point. Now, there are leases based upon rent. This is, for example, when you're renting out a brick and mortar location, like a warehouse or an office space or a retail store. Uh, we have been talking about the hypothetical example of leasing out a brick and mortar toy store in Santa Monica, for example. So that is a lease based upon rent. And is, I'm going to be talking about different types of leases as I go through this presentation. And some of it is a bit confusing, and that's why you need to work with a professional that understands leases. Now, I'm not a leasing expert, but we can refer you to brokers and other leasing experts. Okay, so I have two presentations on the screen, one of which has a little bit more detail than the other, but we'll start with the one on the left, which says leases based upon rates. So there's a lease type called a gross lease. That's probably what most of you are used to. We have a fixed rental rate. And then a net lease is a fixed rental rate plus some operating expenses. And there's a percentage lease. This comes into play, for example, when you're going to lease a retail store in a, mall, in a mall. So there'd be a fixed rental rate plus a percentage of the profits. And then a variable lease, a rental rate that changes over time. I don't, I haven't seen variable leases. That doesn't mean they don't exist, but it's, they're rare. So the other slide has a little bit more detail concerning various types of leases and a little bit more information. So I, I referenced a percentage lease. It's a base rent plus a percent of monthly sales. That's becoming more and more popular for brick and mortar locations in malls and, sh and shopping strips, okay? Then we have a single net lease. So in addition to rent, you're paying some of the taxes, the insurance, and the maintenance. Keep in mind that any commercial lease usually favors the landlord, not the tenant. Which means, by the way, you should always have professional representation when negotiating any contract, including a lease. And there are attorneys that specialize in real estate and leases. And we have referral sources for those attorneys. There's a double net lease where a tenant pays the rent, the taxes and insurance. And then most people are familiar with triple net leases. That is a standard contract that you would sign, for example, if you're going to rent a manufacturing facility. So where the tenant pays the rent, the taxes, insurance, maintenance, you're paying everything. Okay, that's what, you, what it's coming down to. That's a triple net lease. And then there's a gross lease where the landlord directly pays all the most common costs. And these costs are often passed on to the tenant in, in basically it's common area maintenance. Okay, so those are some of the different types of commercial real estate leases. The most common that I've seen is a percentage lease and a triple net lease. Keep that in mind. And if you are leasing right now, then most likely you're facing either a fixed rental rate, a percentage lease, or a triple net lease. If you have some other arrangement, I'd be curious, please put it into the Q and A to see what type of lease you have. Thank you. By the way, Lauren has put an email, her email in the chat room. 
So if you want to get in touch with one of our advisors or me, uh, feel free to write to you and she can make that happen. Now, there is something called a load factor referenced in here. It's a method of calculating total monthly rental costs to a tenant that combines something called usable square feet and a percentage of square feet of common areas. And common areas, by the way, include restrooms, lobbies, elevators, stairwells, hallways. That's, that's all common areas. So oftentimes the lease will include a cam charge, common area maintenance charge to cover payment for those areas. This is another representation that provides a little bit more information concerning the various lease terms. And if you're not involved you know, on a day-to-day -day basis in leasing, it gets really confusing. Again, the most common one to consider is a triple net lease, which is a lease agreement on a property with a tenant or leasee pays all the expenses of the property, including real estate taxes, building, insurance, in maintenance. So that means when you're reviewing a lease, first of all, you need to understand what type of lease you have. Second of all, you need to understand what the charges are associated with insurance, real estate, maintenance. And these terms are sometimes negotiable in addition to the actual rental rate. Now there's other types of commercial leases like percentage leases, and the percentage should be negotiated, and that's not referenced in this particular slide, okay? So there's something called a modified gross lease where the tenant pays a base rent, but then takes on a proportional share of some of the other costs associated with the property. I typically have not seen that as a full service lease where the tenant pays a base rent and landlord pays for all operating expenses. That uh, hardly ever happens. Uh, turnkey leases. What that means is the landlord takes the responsibility of making the place ready. So you just get a key, turn it, walk in, and it's done. It's handled. That happens sometimes when the real estate market is slow. And currently, by the way, office buildings are being abandoned and office building values are dropping because people are working from home. Thus, the commercial real estate market, especially when it comes to office buildings, is tanking and it's gonna cause a problem throughout the economy because the values of commercial buildings are dropping, have dropped significantly and people have taken significant losses to offload those buildings. I'm talking about major financial players. Thus, if you are seeking to lease an office somewhere, it may behoove you to start negotiating on something like that because office space right now in certain areas of the country is readily available. It depends on where you live, what type of work you're doing, et cetera, but it's something to think about. There's something called an absolute gross lease where all the operating expenses are paid by the landlord. Yeah, that's highly unlikely to happen. Okay, and there's a gross lease. We have a flat rent fee that encompasses rent and all costs associated with ownership, such as taxes, insurance, and utilities. And then a single net lease, which requires the tenant to pay only the property taxes in addition to rent. A double net, we are paying the property taxes and premiums for insurance. But the vast majority of time, for example, when you're renting out something like a warehouse or manufacturing facility, it will be a triple net lease. Any questions, feel free to put them in the chat room. And obviously, this is just an overview. For more details, you need to speak to somebody conversant in commercial leases, such as a real estate broker or a real estate attorney. Now, there are other types of leases, and I'm not going to go into all the other types of leases, which we typically don't see, like a close-end lease or, or swap lease or wrap lease or import leases or cross-border leasing. Just be aware that these types of leases do exist. What sometimes come up is a sale and leaseback. What a sale and leaseback is, 
a business owner will buy a business property under his or her own name. And that business owner, let's say it's an auto dealership, that business owner of the auto dealership will buy the property where the auto dealership is on and then will lease the property back to his own business. And that's called a sale and lease back. And that was popular years ago. Not so much popular now, but obviously still available and there's tax implications for doing so. So before you decide to engage in a sale and lease back, speak to a real estate broker, speak to a real estate attorney, and speak to a tax accountant because there's all sorts of implications associated with a sale and lease back. By the way, to obtain, to acquire a building, the SBA has a special program called the 504 program where you can put 10% down and acquire a commercial property, but you have to have 51% occupancy of that commercial property for your business. And we do a lot of 504 loans. When I say you do a lot, we help do something called loan packaging. We don't loan directly. We work through the SBA and lending partners to help you get the funding should you want to acquire a business or a property or equipment under a 504 loan. And the down payment is only 10% for a 504 loan. In terms of interest rates, a 504 loan is carrying somewhere around 7, 8%. A 7A loan, which is a very typical SBA loan, which covers working capital and other uh, items, is carrying interest rate depending upon the lender, 12, 13, 14%. So please keep that in mind. Now, there's other types of classifications for leases, which you should be aware of. And there's something called lease financing. So the lease financing can occur when we have, for example, a startup that wants to acquire equipment to make a product. Think of, oh, let's say a baker. And a baker needs ovens, I mean, industrial ovens. That baker doesn't have the capital and doesn't have the, uh, let's say, the cash flow or the credit to get qualified for a loan to buy that, those ovens. What can happen is that baker can go to a lease financing company. The lease financing company will buy the equipment, take title to the equipment, and then lease it to the baker. That is available to you, okay? And that's called lease financing. And there's a lot of lease financing businesses out there and we can turn you on to them. It's that's something that's interesting to you. And this can be applied to all sorts of different types of equipment, okay? Um, so, there is something called a finance versus an operating le lease. A finance lease used to be called a capitalized lease. And we're getting a little bit technical accounting wise, but a finance lease is where the lesser, the, the person that owns the property, transfers all the risk or substantially all the risk rewards related to the asset to the lessee. An operating lease, is where the risk and rewards are not transferred completely. So this is where, for example, you're leasing a vehicle and you have to turn it back to the leasing company at the end of the term of the lease. That's an operating lease because all the risk and rewards are not necessarily being transferred to you as the lessee. So I mentioned what a sale and lease back is. This is an asset sold on an advance agreement to lease it back for fixed lease rentals. It's also known as a buy as a buy par title lease. I already explained it. There's a direct lease where it's a simple lease. The, the asset is either owned by the lesser, he acquires it, also known as a tripartite par title lease. Then we have a single investor versus leverage lease. And again, we get a little bit more complicated. But this is where the lesser arranges money to finance the asset. And the lender is entitled to recover from the lesser only and not from the lessee. 
and then there's a levered lease and domestic versus international lease. We're not getting involved with those types of complications. Just be familiar with sale and lease back, a direct lease and a finance versus an operating lease. I am not going to be talking about taxes as a question in the chat room. I mentioned last week I would be covering leases uh, in, during this presentation. So elements of a commercial lease. These are six things to include in a commercial lease. The notice period for termination. Consequences of breaching the contract lease. A tenant's right to sublet. Any permitted structural modifications, there may be limitations as to the lease settlement agreements, what you can do with the space based upon the commercial lease agreement. Sometimes there's restrictions about the type of signage you can put up and where it can be put and the size of the signage. I mean, these are things that, that you really need to look at when looking at a lease. It also obviously cover the rent, the security department, charges for our maintenance, our CAM, as well as the lease term and the conditions for renewal. And these are not all the elements. It's only some of the elements. Um, let me continue on from there. So key elements of a commercial lease. Obviously, the base rent. This is the amount you have to pay every month just for the rent, okay? Not including CAM charges, common area maintenance charges. It's always a, always a fixed amount. Some usually quoted on a square foot per year basis. Be aware within your locality of what the going rates are for commercial leases. There's a site called LoopNet that you can go to to look up leases. And if we have time, I'll show you that site. Now, additional right may include CAM, may include specific expenses like after hours services, HVAC, uh, those types of things. So this is not going to be included in the base rent. This is an addition to the base rent. Uh, free rent sometimes calls a baited rent, where this happens actually quite a bit, especially in, in a market where the, there's a high vacancy rate. The landlord will offer a tenant free rent for a period of time in order to complete leasehold improvements. They'll bait the rents, sometimes two or three months, or maybe even longer, depending upon the size of the property, the types of negotiations that would be conducted. Okay. Um, so this is something that you want to negotiate through your real estate broker with the representative for the landlord, with the landlord directly. directly. Obviously, many landlords will work through a real estate broker. You should have your own real estate broker. So I already mentioned what tour keys is. This is where you basically, all the work has been done. You tell a landlord what you want to do, they do it. And then you get a key and you just walk into the place and you don't have to touch anything. It's, it's already been done for you. That's a turnkey space that might, for example, occur in a retail shop where the shelving is already there and it's all set to go. And all you have to do is bring your equipment, some furniture, and there you go. You have a retail shop. Now, usable square feet is the square footage that is rented and used exclusively by the tenant. It doesn't include common area maintenance, common, uh, common areas, I mean. Now, let me continue on from here. Rentable square feet, that refers to common areas that are shared amongst tenants, along with usable square feet. And that might include hallways, stairwells, et cetera. Okay. Now we'll move on to insurance. So there's all different types of insurance, and I have a separate presentation on insurance, and I've given it before during these workshops. So there's property insurance, liability insurance, business interruption insurance, leasehold insurance, and a number of other different insurances that you can acquire. Business property insurance is carried by the landlord in case there's damage done to the building. 
but it does not protect you. You can carry inventory insurance. You can carry business interruption insurance. So should something happen to that property and you are on a lease and you have to relocate, business interruption insurance will pay for the relocation and also cover lost income. For example, it will not cover lost inventory. That's a separate insurance policy called inventory insurance. You need to speak with your inventory, I'm sorry, with your insurance agent, broker, or carrier to make sure you have the proper insurances in place for your business. It's extremely important to understand the insurance policies, what they cover. For example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, many businesses could not collect from the insurance companies, even though they had business interruption insurance, because there was a clause that excluded pandemics in their policies. And no one ever reads their policies. Read your policy, understand what it covers, and take a look to see if pandemic is an exclusion if you're carrying one of those um, insurance policies. So I already told you what the lease term is. It represents the entire period your lease is considered active. Okay. A use clause that defines how the space can be used. And there may be all sorts of limitations as, how, as to how you may use the space. You may think because you have a lease, you can do whatever you want within that space. Absolutely not true. You have to look at your lease to determine what it permits. And it could be broad restrictions as to how you might use the space. There may be a restriction against you subletting it unless you get signed approval from the landlord. So do not assume you can just do whatever you want once you get a lease signed. Not true. It may there's sometimes exclusivity rules in place for strip malls. So there may already be someone selling fashion clothes in that strip mall. Thus, you will not be permitted to sell fashion clothes in that strip mall because there's an exclusivity clause. Do not assume they're going to be able to do whatever you want just because you have a lease. Absolutely not true. Okay. Uh, you might have requirements associated with financial performance. Uh, and you need to be sure that you're going to meet those requirements. So the term clause defines the length of your lease, specifies the commencement date, the expiration date, renewal options. Is, and before signing, you need to consider what's going to happen down the road. I have those conversations quite a bit. One of the first questions I ask them if they have a lease is, when is it up? When is due for renewal? And what is the renewal clause? And how is it calculated if there's going to be an increase in the rent? There's different ways of calculating that entry, that increase. There's different types of classifications for commercial buildings. And depending upon that classification, it may determine the increase. I'm, I'm working with a client right now where their rent is being tripled this year tripled and their lease allows for it and this is a company doing you know three four million dollars a year and they knew that going in they didn't expect actually that it would be tripled and now they're trying to negotiate it and it's a difficult negotiation so understand the manner in which the escalation occurs understand your renewal options you might want to have two five-year renewal options because once you get into a space and you're building clientele you may not want to leave within five years. You might want the option to renew that at a reasonable rate for another five years and then another five years. Or you might want the option to leave in three years. The actual term length is something that you need to consider. Now, most landlords don't want you in for a year. They want you in for a couple of years, depending upon market factors. Okay? So rent costs can include additional factors other than simply the amount of rent you'll be paying. They, like I said, there's automatic rent increase mechanisms in many leases. That really review your lease before you sign it. And if you don't understand it, 
speak to somebody who's knowledgeable about us. Come to us. We have people that can help you interpret these uh, these clauses, and we can give you negotiating strategies. So, Nazif, you stated that you were in an old lease from the 90s and the building sold in 2019. My camp tripled overnight. Is there anything you can do? Yes. Go to a real estate attorney, have them review the lease, and see if they can nego help negotiate it for you. Yes, there is something you can do, but don't try to do it by yourself. It all depends upon the terms of the lease. That's why a real estate attorney needs to review the lease. By the way, once a lease is up, uh, you will auto most most times you'll go on a month to month, and basically a month to month, the same terms apply even uh, you know from the lease, even though we're on a month to month. All right. So oftentimes the question comes up is, well, should I do a rent? Should I do a buy versus a lease? A rent is different than a lease. Okay. A rent arrangement is short term. Okay. And the pro about a rent arrangement, you have access to the best equipment. You're, you are in entertainment. Uh, you're a uh, cameraman and you have your own business doing videos. And you say, you know, for, for this particular shoot that's going to last a couple of months, I need the best equipment I get. You don't want to lease it. You don't want to buy it. You just want to rent it for a few months. That option is available to you. That's a short-term agreement. Because once the rent is over and the, the shoot is done, you don't want to keep on keep that expensive piece of equipment. But you may need it for that particular. I just want to try it out. Okay? So it gives you the opportunity to access the best equipment. Um, it keeps savings flowing and helps contractors with small cash reserves. That's true because you're not necessarily locking yourself up into a buy or a lease. You're just renting it. Okay. And yes, you can help you forecast your cash flow because you know you're just renting it for a small period of time. And yeah, you can replace that equipment. Oftentimes when it comes to technical equipment, it changes quickly. Uh, I know there are some cameras out there in the film world entertainment world that can cost 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars or more. You might want access to that equipment and you might want to replace it every time there's a new technological change. So you might want to rent it for a little bit, then turn it back in and then rent the next one, the next version of that equipment. And yeah, there's less responsible repairs and maintenance unless you break it. You break it, you own it. That's probably what the rental agreement says. Always, always, always have insurance for equipment. That's a separate insurance policy. There's equipment insurance you can buy. Now, the con of renting is not suited for long-term use. The rental rates can fluctuate, so the rental rate that you're paying this month may change the next month. It may, it may go up, may go down. And again, if you damage that equipment, it's going to be problematic for you, okay? Um, and there should be some willingness to compromise on, on the equipment model because the specific piece of equipment that you want may not be available, but there might be the next best thing. Then we have the buy component. Well, the pro is it, you own the equipment outright. No one has the right to use it. It's yours. You own it. It's done. You can sell it. You can use it the way you see fit but you own it. So this is beneficial for equipment with a longer useful lifespan. So think about a machine shop when they have to buy three and four access uh, CNC milling machines. Those machines, and I have clients that have those. Uh, I, I know quite a bit about manufacturing. Those machines last for 10, 15, 20 years, all right? So it doesn't make sense for them to rent those machines. They'd rather buy those machines. Okay, and yes, there's tax breaks. There's, con there's something called bonus depreciation that you can take for equipment. Again, I'm not going into the tax consequences of leasing right now or buying. Um, now, yeah, there's a higher initial cost. The risk, there's a risk of getting outdated equipment. We all know that if you buy a vehicle and you're one of those people who likes to hang on to vehicles, as I am, my vehicle dates back to 2015. I don't have all the bells and whistles. 
uh, that the newer vehicles have in my vehicle. I don't have the warning if you change lane unexpectedly or something in the way. I don't have the latest uh, audio visual components of the internet connections, but, but it's paid off and I own it and I'm happy. Okay. I don't need all the bells and whistles associated with new vehicle, but that's me. And I'm not using it for commercial purposes. You may decide differently, but there is a risk of investing in equipment that might not fit a company's needs. And you do have the responsibilities for maintenance and repair. So even though my vehicle is paid off, I have to, I just had to replace the transmission. I just had to replace the brakes. Those are the things you have to do when equipment breaks down. And at some point you have to make a decision. Is it appropriate to go get another piece of equipment or to just continue to repair and maintenance? And at some point it makes sense to give up the ghost and go get a different piece of equipment once you buy something. And then there's a leasing. Long-term agreement. Yep, it is a long-term agreement. They might be a lower list of cost because you're not having to necessarily put up a significant amount of money to get that piece of equipment. Uh, often includes a purchasing option, which means at the end of the lease, think about a car lease, you can buy it out. But the buyout for a piece of equipment might be a dollar, might be a hundred bucks. Depends how it's negotiated. Okay. There's still tax deductibility. Uh, leases can be flexible in the way you negotiate them. And yes, sometimes upgradability is, is allowed for that equipment, depending upon the arrangement that you make with the lessor. In the long run, can it be cost costlier? Possibly. Uh, you don't own the equipment. Not until you buy it out. It's still not your equipment. Okay? And you have to make those payments in the entire lease term. Absolutely true. Contractors are usually responsible for insurance and personal property taxes. Well, yep, that's right. And there could be minor damages that could result in exorbitant fees. Think about a car lease. Uh, and you turn it in, and there's damage to the vehicle unless you buy insurance against that. The the auto dealer might charge you a ridiculous fee for those minor damages. So I can't tell you what to do unless I know specific details behind what you're trying to achieve. And that is why it's always about the details. It depends. It depends on what your goals is in your industry and what you're trying to do. And then we can make a rational decision about what's appropriate. So it also depends upon market factors and other issues. So here's some more information about leasing versus buying. So it's a leasing is a good option for conserving your cash flow because you only need to make monthly rental payments, maybe a deposit, okay? But buying equipment can be expensive. It's an outright purchase. I'm not talking about a loan. I'm talking about an outright purchase of equipment. You have to put the cash up front, okay? <clears throat> Which means you're going to have less cash on hand for your operating expenses. If you purchase using a loan, then you need to organize this finance along with a deposit, repaying its interest. And yes, you can get an SBA back loan to buy equipment with 10% down plus a few fees, but the interest rates are seven, eight, nine percent not three, four percent like they were a few years, a year or two ago. And the interest rates keep going up. Um, with lease equipment, you don't have active ownership of the asset. You buy it, you own it. Depending upon the terms of the lease, it can be easier to upgrade true and replace equipment. You can if you buy it, you can possibly sell it if there's a market for it. If there's no market for it, you can't sell it. And yes, I'm from Boston. And that's why you hear me say market. I can't pronounce it any other way. The lifetime cost of lease equipment is usually more expensive to buying. It depends. You have to do an analysis, right? Lease payments are typically tax deductible, true. But you should always get advice from a tax attorney before you make these decisions. And yes, you can claim, claim depreciation of the equipment on your taxes, including something called bonus depreciation. You might be able to deduct the entire value of the equipment as bonus depreciation, Section 179 depreciation. Um, maintenance costs are often free as part of the leasing agreement. 
you are responsible for maintenance and service costs, the warranty may run out like it does on vehicles. And yes, you can buy extended warranties, possibly for a vehicle, but that, that may not be available for equipment. Now, a lot of questions come up about vehicle leasing, car leasing, and yes, you can use your cars for commercial purposes. All right. So there are things to consider when we're talking about vehicle uh, leasing. First of all, you have to understand what the capital cost is, which is basically, and we'll go through that. Understand what the residual value is because there might be a buyout. Understand what a money factor is, and you can convert the money factor. And oftentimes, a lease is reference in terms of a money factor. So you take that money factor, multiply by 2,400, and that gives you the equivalent of an interest rate. Uh, there are fees that you have to pay when you lease. So you have to add that to the total sum finance. And there may, may be incentives offered by the auto dealership uh, for you to go ahead and you know go forward with that vehicle lease. Keeping in mind, that used car prices are still relatively high. And so maybe a lease might be better given the fact that pricing is so high and you may wanna turn that vehicle in in three years and then buy something a little less expensive. I can't tell you what to do. It's something that you need to think about. So we're gonna go through an example of a lease versus buy and that comes up all the time. Here we have an example where we have the car value at $24,000. And by the way, in this market, maybe it's probably $30,000. There's some fees associated with leasing, um, $1,000. And again, this market might be much higher than that. You put down 2,500, so we have a capitalized value of $22,500. 24,000 plus 1,000, less 2,500. And we have a Perceive residual value of 14,500, maybe after three years, okay? And we're gonna be making those payments 12 times a year for a total of 36 payments. And the money factor is a 0 0.0025. And if you're interested, you must abide by 2,400. That equates to an interest rate of 6%. And of course, because we live in California, you have to pay a tax for all physical goods. This tax rate is actually low. It's more like 10%, but here's an example, okay? So with a lease, you have to determine the monthly rental and that's taken the capitalized value plus the residual value, 22,500 plus 14,500 and multiplying it by the money factor. And that math results in $92.50 for the monthly rental, but we're not done. Then you have to figure out the monthly tax. So you take the monthly depreciation and the monthly rent, and there's a way to calculate the monthly depreciation, and you multiply it by the tax rate. And that comes up with a monthly tax of $18.88. And the depreciation is calculated by taking the capitalized value, which is 22,500, less the residual value, which is 14,500, and dividing by the total number of payments, which in this case is 36, and that gives you depreciation charges of 222.22. So the total monthly payment based upon this scenario for a lease is $333.61. I realize for those who you are not used to doing math, or you just get turned off by math, there's calculators all over the place on the internet where you type in the numbers and it'll do the math for you, okay? Now, you could potentially buy this vehicle. And if you buy the vehicle, loan amount is 22,500, which is the capital, capitalized value that you see above. At the interest rate of 6%, the monthly payment will be $681, more than double than the monthly payment. However, at the end, I mean, you know, at the end of three years, you don't own the lease vehicle unless you buy it out. But when you buy the vehicle, you own it. Once you pay it all off and you, you release the lien on the vehicle, 
I, I paid off my vehicle a couple of years ago. I own it. I can sell it, do whatever I want with it. Okay, so I don't have to buy it out. It's a decision that you need to make. If you're trying to preserve cash and you need a vehicle for your business, you might want to consider a lease. If you want to buy the vehicle and not worry about the, buying it out later, um, you just flat out buy it. Get a loan and then buy it. Okay. But before you make the decision, work through a financial analysis. And if you need help, come see us. We can help you figure out what makes sense for you. Um, and you're, somebody put in, in the Q&A, thank you for the information. You're more than welcome. This is what we're here to do. We're here to help you. Okay. There's something called capitalized leases. And this is confusing to everybody. It's confusing to accounts who don't deal with capitalized leases. It's confusing to business owners. It's confusing to attorneys. And I get it. I understand why. There are certain leases for assets that you have to put on your balance sheet versus your income statement. Assets on balance sheets are assets that are gonna be able to last you more than a year, okay? Uh, and there, there are assets that are used to generate profit for yourself. So a piece of equipment will generate sales for yourself. An asset is something that you own. A liability is something that you owe. Now, it used to be if you had an operating lease, like a, a renting a car, for example, you didn't have to capitalize it. You didn't have to have it on the balance sheet. You could just deduct the expense of leasing the vehicle on your income statement. That is no longer the case. The Federal Accounting Standards Board's FASB changed the rules, in, I think it was 2020. And the International Financial Reporting Standards, IFS, I, IFRS, is considering changing the rules. So that what that means is essentially all leases must now be capitalized. So a capitalized lease is an accounting approach that posts a company's lease obligation as an asset on the balance sheet. Now, there's pros and cons to doing this, right? The con is it makes the company's return on assets lower. Return on assets compares sales to your assets. So it's a measure to determine how effective you are in using your asset to generate sales. Obviously, if you're in this particular case, your return on assets will be lower in regards to that ratio. The pro is you can deduct interest components yearly for taxes and depreciation can be claimed. All right, so there's a pro to it. Now, there's an accounting rules that are specific as to how this occurs. I'm not here to make you an accountant. I'm going to suggest to you that if you're considering a major lease, lease of equipment, even if it's a vehicle that you consult with an accountant, a CPA, so they can explain to you the impact of capitalized leases to, to your particular business. I have more on this, however. So the specific rule is topic 842 put out by FASB, Financial Accounting Standards Board. You can see the new rules here. You know, if there's a transfer ownership to lessee at the end of the term, if it meets that requirement, if there's a purchase option, the lessee reasonably is certain to exercise, like a $100 buyout, is the lease term for the major part of the remaining economic life, uh, is a present value of lease payments equals or exceeds substantially all the fair value. Bottom line is most leases now for equipment, for vehicles, would be considered a finance lease, previously known as a capitalized lease. It would have to be capitalized. There's something called operating leases. So you can see here, there's, there's a write-up. The biggest change as a result of the new lease accounting standard will be that lessees will need to recognize operating leases on their balance sheet. This was not a requirement before they changed the rules. Although operating leases will be reported on the balance sheet, the lease liability is intended to be classified as an operating liability rather than debt. Again, this is getting technical. Lessees should consult with the lenders to determine any potential impacts on their credit lines and covenants. So if we have a loan and it's covenants in the loan, as often happens, 
capitalizing on lease will have an impact on your balance sheet, which may impact on your covenants and credit lines. So the new lease st accounting standard maintains the concept of a finance lease, formerly known as a capital lease, and an operating lease. Um, now, so prior to this ruling, operating leases were not captured on the balance sheet. However, under this new ASC accounting standard rule, both operating leases and finance leases, formerly known as capital leases, need to be included on the balance sheet. And there's a guide here that explains all this. Once again, talk to your tax preparer, talk to your accountant for an understanding of how this works. And by the way, some accounts are not up to speed on it yet. Most are, but not everybody. By the way, leases less than 12 months are not required to be capitalized on the balance sheet. So what's an operating lease? It's defined as a lease in which the lessee gets control of the use of the underlying assets without ownership. Previously, operating leases were recorded liabilities. Think about the equipment that you might have to turn in after you're done using it under a lease for longer than a year, okay? That's an operating lease. Now, all operating leases, except for short-term leases, must be capitalized as right-of-use assets, okay? That's the key point. And there's a particular method about how you do this. I'm not going to go into that level of detail. Just keep in mind that there's an impact to your balance sheet income statement when it comes to capitalizing what used to be operating leases. And there's, there's actually a link here that explains an example, and it's quite detailed in this presentation. I can provide this presentation to Lauren, who will then send it out to you if you ask for it, and her email is in the chat room. So that's all the equipment and other types of leases. You can lease employees. You can lease workers through something known as a PEO, Professional Employer Organization. So what's a leased employee? It's someone who has used a paycheck from a leasing company while performing services for you, okay? The employer controls the work while the leasing firm handles wages and taxes and, and all that other type of stuff, okay? So the employer pays the leasing firm, the leasing firm pays the, the employees. So there are some benefits associated with employee leasing that you can see here. You get rid of all the administrative stuff, not all of it, much of it. You don't have to worry about the, the payroll issue. That's all handled by the leasing company. And claims processing and regulatory compliance and unemployment, that's all handled through the PEO. And many firms use PEOs. Uh, leasing firms can combine the employees of different companies into one larger group, thus possibly be able to get better rates on healthcare and other insurances, which is actually a very nice benefit. Uh, and many small businesses cannot afford an HR person or HR consultants, but leasing firms employ hundreds, sometimes thousands, so they have an abundance of knowledge associated with HR issues. And employee leasing is often available for a flat rate. So if you are in a business that lends itself to a situation like a warehouse, you might consider employee leasing. Of course, the devil's in the details and you need to have a much better understanding than this as to whether or not you should engage a PEO firm. This is basically another graphical representation of how it works. On the right-hand side, you have a PEO client service agreement. That's a co-employment relationship, which means the employee can sue you and the PEO for things like harassment, okay? Uh, so you have the employer and you have the operating employee and the administrative employer, and they all kind of combine together. And there's another graphic on the left-hand side that explains the benefits, right? When it comes to your employees, you have to hire, you have to train them, you have to schedule them, you have to do reviews, you have to manage them, you have to terminate them, you have to handle payroll and other actions like workers' comp. A, P a PEO handles all the payroll issues, is able to possibly get a better group health rate, handles workers' comp, provides human resource support, and manages and remits payroll. It handles all the payroll. 
uh, handles all the regulations associated with new hires. And there's a bunch of new regulations in place right now as effective one one for California to hire employees. And by the way, all workers must be employees under AB5 that came about as in 2018, unless the workers meet an exception. And the most common exception is a B2B exception. So if you think you're going to hire a bunch of workers as independent contractors, forget about it. They need to have their own business in place and you need to prove it. Because the state of California has lost out on hundreds of millions of dollars on workers' comp and unemployment insurance. The state of California does not like the gig economy. The state of California wants you to hire employees and put them on W-2. And the state of California has a task force going out right now auditing companies going back years. And they are imposing fines, penalties, and back taxes with tax, back taxes on small businesses like salons and martial arts studios and gyms and retail stores. So the thought that you're going to hire a bunch of independent contractors and not pay uh, payroll taxes, forget about it. The state of California has put a kibosh on that, as have 30 other states. So don't think you're going to go to another state. They're, they might even be stricter than the state of California to hire independent contractors. This might be a way to handle that issue. So that concludes my presentation on this. Uh, someone's asking, what does capitalize mean? Capitalize, mean? capitalize means that you're taking an asset. So for example, you're buying a piece of equipment that costs, let's say, $30,000. And you are not expensing that piece of equipment on your income statement. You are putting that piece of equipment on your balance sheet as a fixed asset. Because the equipment can last long, it has a useful life of longer than one year. That's what capitalized means, Gail. And Kalichi, the presentation is going to be available on our YouTube channel. I'm also going to send the presentation to Lauren. And if you write to her email, she'll provide it to you. If there's no other, we are coming up to the two o'clock hour. Uh, as there are no other questions, I will go ahead and close out the session. I will be back next week. And I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And I hope everybody has a good day. Good day, everybody. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.